the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to you, Christ. Today we celebrate the birth of Our Lady, the Theotokos, the Ever Virgin Mary. And many Americans would maybe bristle at the idea of celebrating her birthday. And when we consider what this actually means, we have to ask the question, why is it okay to celebrate the birthdays of other people, famous people? So for example, we have in our calendar, our secular calendar, President's Day, because Abraham, Lincoln, and George Washington were born in the middle of February. We celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day because it's a Monday close to his birthday on January 15th. We celebrate the birthdays of movements, July 4th, the birthday of freedom in the United States. Or in the Protestant Reformation, they celebrate Reformation Day when Martin Luther started the whole thing on October 31st. And this last day, Reformation Day, is probably important because a lot of those who have an issue with our celebration of Our Lady's birthday also came out of that movement. They've been at war with the Roman Catholic Church for over five centuries, and part of their attack on Rome has been to place Our Lady in the crosshairs. And most sadly, many have gone so far as to denigrate her, to insult her. And the phrase that I've heard, the one that probably is most, most painful is to hear, is to say that she's just a tool that God used in his plan for salvation. So why would we honor her? Well, I would pose a question to those who would think such things. First of all, how do they themselves normally define the life of a Christian believer? Would they not often describe it as faith in a personal God, in a personal and intimate relationship with Jesus Christ? Would they not rightly say that God sees every human being as unique, that He loves each human being individually and works with them individually? So then why would we not apply the same logic to believers 2,000 years ago, particularly the one he chose to be his mother according to the flesh? Why would we believe that he used the Theotokos merely as a tool that he has randomly chosen, or something like winning the lottery, instead of actually having an intimate and deep relationship with her before he actually chose her? When we look to the scriptures, we find actually that this is the case. When the Archangel Gabriel comes to her, he says, he says, Rejoice, highly favored one, blessed are you among women. And if we would for a second think that this is just something that would have been said to anyone, he then clarifies, he says, You, you, Mary, have found favor with God. Something she has done, the life she has lived, has drawn God's attention. The relationship she had established with her Lord was now leading all to this moment when she would become the mother of God in the flesh. And so she's not simply an instrument of God's will, she's much more than that. She is that unique person God was waiting to choose because of the faithful relationship she had with Him. So let us consider why then did He choose her, and why her life is an example for our lives of faith, our personal relationship with Christ. Now the first thing we can say is that the scripture makes it clear God chose her because of her humble obedience. When already we first meet her in St. Luke's Gospel, we see her humility when the archangel comes and explains to her what's happening. He tells her, you will bear the Son of the Most High. Now, if she were someone who were proud, prideful, if she were someone who somehow wanted power and authority, she would have said, yes, give it to me. But instead, she's perplexed. She doesn't think she's worthy. She doesn't understand how this can be. And she says, how can this be? She asks the angel. And the angel goes on to explain to her what exactly God is going to do. He is going to come. The Holy Spirit will overshadow her, and she will conceive the Son of the Most High God Himself. And when she understands now what she's being asked to do, her words are very simple. She says, Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. We see this moment of humility, of obedience to God. It's the same sort of thing we see when we first encounter her in St. John's Gospel, which is at a certain wedding in the city of Cana. 
there in the wedding. We don't know who it is that's getting married, but we know they must be close to the apostles. There's someone that the family of the failed Pogos must know, because she's been invited as well. And there she is, gathered together with all of them, and they've run out of wine for the festival. Now this would have been seen as very shameful. If you were a married couple, you and your family would have had to arrange this thing for some time. You would have had to hire a master of the feast to take care of all these little details. And if things did not go according to plan, your marriage was not off to an auspicious start. And so, in order to, sh to save them from shame, the failed focus is concerned for the couple. And so goes to the Lord and says, they have run out of wine. Now again, many translations, somewhat purposely I think, mistranslate this, because the original Greek is very clear. It does not say, what does that have to do with me, woman? It's not what it actually says. It says in Greek, to you and unto me, O lady, what is this concern to us? In other words, he's on the same side as his mother. He's saying, how should we get involved with this, my lady? What is our role in this whole thing? She doesn't say anything else, but she points the servants to him and says, whatever he says to do, now do it. And then he tells them what to do. They fill the water pots, he goes, he prays, and then the water is turned into wine, and the festivities continue. That newlywed couple is saved from shame. And so in this, we see again Our Lady, she humbly comes to her son and asks, and then is obedient to whatever he decides. Whatever he says to do, do it. And there the first miracle in John's Gospel is recorded. The first of only seven signs that he actually mentions in his Gospel. So we, if we want to be like the failed Focos, should look to her humility and learn from it. All the saints teach us that humility is a state of being that comes through active acts of obedience. Obedience to the will of God is the goal, is something that must be worked out in this world. Some of you have maybe heard me quote some of my favorite stories from the sayings of the Desert Fathers, those 4th and 5th century Egyptian monks who set the standard for later monasticism. And one of my favorite, at least in my top five, was the story of Abba John the Dwarf. And Abba John, it says, when he was a first new monk out there in the desert of Egypt, under his abbot, he was given a task, an obedience, as they call it in monasticism. He was told to take a staff, a piece of dead wood, to carry it out far into the desert, a half day's journey away from where the monastic settlement was, to stick it into the ground and plant it there, and then to walk the rest of the day back, arriving at nightfall. And then the abbot told him each day he was to take a bucket of water, and walk that same journey, water that staff, and return at nightfall. And he did this day after day in obedience. After some time, probably to the amusement of the other monks who thought that this was insane, the abbot says, why don't you come with me and follow Abba John today and see what he's doing? And they travel with him out into the desert, and there the dead staff has now sprouted into a live tree and was bearing beautiful fruit. And the abbot pointed to the, to the tree and said to the other monks, Behold the fruit of obedience. You see, Abba John became known as one of the most humble monks in those monastic stories. And it was because he practiced obedience to God through humbling himself to others, just like the Theotokos does. Another thing we can say about the Theotokos is that she was chosen by God because of her deep inner contemplation. St. Luke, in his Gospel, paints an image of her as a woman who's immersed in prayer and in inner quietude. He tells us that after everything she experienced, after the Archangel Gabriel comes and she hears this incredible message, after the odor shattering of the Spirit of God and the conception of the Lord Jesus, after his birth, which was, as St. Luke says, accompanied by signs in the heaven, angels singing, seen by shepherds, after all this, Luke says simply this. He says that Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Forty days later, then she would take the newborn Jesus into the temple and make the standard offerings for the firstborn son. And a prophet named Simeon approaches them. And St. Simeon says this to her. He prophesies first about his impending death, that he will die for his people. And then he tells her, a sword will pierce your soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. 
He's telling her that she will suffer on, be, on, on behalf of her son. She will be there suffering with him throughout the many things he undergoes. But through her suffering, all those inner things that she pondered, all those secrets will eventually be revealed to the world because the inner life of the saint that's born in quiet, in that deep prayer, that eventually comes forth into the world, is revealed to others to guide us, to help us. St. Gregory Palamas has a long sermon where he says that Our Lady of the Theotokos is the very first hesychast. Now this is a word we don't often encounter, but in Greek it means the practice of stillness, of inner stillness. And so she's described as one who listened to and pondered the Word of God and prayerfully meditated on it in, it, in her heart, and therefore she becomes an example of what it means to be a contemplative. Our Gospel reading is focused on that. If you listen carefully, the Gospel reading that we have for today, which is chosen for the Feast of the Theotokos, is really talking about a different Mary. It's talking about Mary, the sister of Lazarus, and how she's there at the feet of the Lord, listening to Him and pondering His words, just as Luke has earlier described the Theotokos. And so the early church made this connection, that Luke is connecting the two Marys here, and then it jumps forward to the, the words of one of the ladies in the crowd, and our Lord is correcting the woman. She's not blessed simply because she's a tool, an instrument who happened to be the one to give birth to and nurse him. Blessed are those, rather, who have heard the word of God and kept it, which up to that point, St. Luke has made clear, is the Theotokos. And so we see here again as this, inner, as this inner quietude, this monastic sense within her heart, that she becomes an example of all the monastics after her. Any monastery you go to, an Orthodox monastery throughout the world, they have Our Lady as a patroness. They do specific services and prayers asking her to guide them, that they may obtain that inner prayer that she had. In Psalm 45, it's a prophecy of the Theotokos, but first it's known as a prophecy of the coming Messiah. It's quoted in the New Testament about the Messiah's coming, but then it shifts and talks about the Messiah's queen mother. And it describes her as not just the queen of heaven in that particular prophecy, but then speaks about those who will come after her. And it says this, the virgins, her companions who follow her, shall be brought to you, meaning to the Messiah. With gladness and rejoicing they shall be brought, they shall enter into the king's palace. You see, all those who want to follow that virginal life, like the Theotokos, are ones who enter into that, that life of inner prayer and contemplation, of hesychasm. And this is not just a life for monks and nuns living off cloistered somewhere in a monastery. All of us need to learn from this. All of us need to learn to simplify our lives, to make more time to stand silent in God's presence, to first transfer that external quiet into an internal quiet which restores the soul through prayer. And by looking to her, we can see her as the example in order to live that out in our lives. We can give one more reason why the Lord has chosen her. He chose her because of her evangelical zeal. This one probably isn't as obvious to us. We rare, but we rarely ever depict Our Lady by herself. When we show her in almost all images, we always show her holding our Lord, pointing us to her Son. This is how we show her. Because when we read about her in the Scripture, her entire life is pointing towards her Son. That's what she does. She puts us in that direction. When she visits her cousin Elizabeth, it says that she was filled with the Spirit and begins to hymn. And that song that she sings is more like a sermon. She begins, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. And she goes on to describe who her Savior is, the one who is coming to topple the mighty, to lift up the humble and establish His kingdom on this earth. And she's telling us who her Lord is, not from some abstract idea, not from simply a reading of the Old Testament, but rather something deeper. She knows Him personally and is speaking about the Lord that she knows. And for this reason, she's able to become an evangelist and point us towards her son. It's with that same zeal that she spoke to him at the wedding at Cana and then told the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. She points the servants to her son. 
It's with the same zeal that she stood at the foot of the cross. When all the other apostles had fled the Lord, she stood there and points us towards him. It's with the same zeal that she went into the upper room with the other apostles. And there it says she received the gift of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And we're also told in the scripture that she's entrusted, her care is entrusted to the apostle John. And oral tradition makes clear that she then traveled with St. John. She became a minister with him as he preached the gospel towards the end of her life. You see, she has always had this zeal to preach her son. We should look to her then as an example of evangelism. So all these things work together then. If we see her as the exemplar, then first we must, like her, acquire humility in the Lord. We must be obedient to God's will. We must be obedient to the various things that God puts in front of us to humble us. And through that deep humility, we then enter into a state of contemplation. We learn to simplify and quiet our lives, to be immersed in deep prayer at all times. And then out of that sort of being, out of that state of the soul, a humble and quiet soul that stands before God, out of that can come great things and can lead others to Christ. That can lead to a zeal that, that points others towards our Lord. There's a saying which has been attributed to many different saints. I don't think we've ever figured out which one it was. It's been attributed to saints back as far as the fourth century, which says that we should preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. That is a good way to describe the Theotokos. She embodied everything that it means to be a servant of God. She said, behold the handmaiden. Literally, she said, behold the slave of the Lord. She says, let me point everyone towards him. And her life becomes an example of what it means then to be a follower of Christ. So let us take her life very seriously. Let us honor and praise what she has done, all of her deeds, and what she became through faith. Let us celebrate her birthday today because it is honorable. Her life teaches us very importantly that God loves each of us uniquely. We can agree with others on that. But because he does that, he does not instrumentalize any of us. He invites each of us into a deep and personal relationship as we are members of the people of God, the church. Let us follow then this path that we can be like her, the Theotokos, and may in due time be what she had, it is now, to be seated next to the one who is truly our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who together with his unorigined Father, is a holy, good, and life-giving spirit, are worshiped and glorified from the ages of ages.